All right, just real quick before we get into the video proper. Yeah, just like you guys, I did manage to see the teaser trailers across this weekend. I know a lot of you are asking what I think they mean, and teaser alert before the end of the week, I honestly have no idea. Uh, when they first launched, I genuinely thought that these had nothing to do with Total Warhammer 3 because there wasn't really any implications towards Total Warhammer 3. Like, it had nothing to do with the demons, it had nothing to do with the Ogre Kingdom, the Chaos Dwarves, nothing. That being said... There was a metaphor, or uh, someone claimed a metaphor that I saw in the comments for the second teaser now that sort of does make sense, wherein the first teaser trailer kind of looks like a metaphor for corn, as it is about martial prowess, the particular zodiac sign that they looked at. The second sign, the piper, is a bit of a metaphor for Sinch, because people that are born under that sign are duplicitous and, you know, clever. So it could be that they're teasing the Demons of Chaos coming up, but honest to God, I have literally no idea. Um, I hope it's a, an announcement for Total Warhammer 3, even if I do think we still are owed one more DLC for Total Warhammer 2 first. I am going to try my absolute damnedest to get a video out in proper and do a deep dive into this, but just understand that with all these videos for the hardware stuff, it just chews through my time, so I haven't had an opportunity to yet. Alright, last week we took a look at CPU frequency and saw how that affected Total War. However, CPU frequency is only really one half of the equation for CPUs. The other part of them is how much CPU do you have available. By this I mean how many cores and how many threads do you have available to work on the game. Now, because unfortunately the Monopoly Man refuses to answer my request for free money, I don't have the option to buy multiple CPUs and check this, but there's a simple easy workaround here. Going into my BIOS, I can disable cores and disable threads as required, so that's what we'll do today. We'll take a look at various options and see what impact they have on Total War. We will also take a look to see what they allow in terms of overclocking because that's the other half of this equation. Typically speaking, less cores means more available overclocking headroom simply due to the fact that there's less heat being produced. Alright, first things first, if you didn't watch last week's video, go and watch that one before this one because I'm not going to rehash the entire video and a lot of this week's video isn't going to make sense without it. So for those of you who did watch last week's video, we had our metaphor being a guy working in a hole, being the, the, guy act the core actually working on Total Warhammer, and the guys above him being the ones that are just doing system processes or irrelevant background crap. The rules were that we couldn't pay one guy more than the others, and that generally speaking, to get anyone to work faster, we had to pay them more, and payment in this case being a metaphor for voltage and heat. One solution that we did try to look at yesterday was in bypassing that equal clock fact and giving the guy in the hole more voltage just to get him to work faster without paying all the guys above him more as a requirement. However, admittedly it didn't really work out last week just because of the way I have everything set up, but the metaphor itself still worked. So, continuing on to today's episode, you can already see another way we can make our budget go further. Instead of paying for a whole bunch of guys to stand around doing nothing, we could just simply Thanos snap half these guys out of existence. Ah, clear my browser history. Now, some of you are wondering why we Thanos snapped them rather than just not paying them or firing them. And to you, I say, my metaphor, my rules. But anyways, our budget now can be allocated to half the guys, or a quarter of the guys, or however many we choose. This is a perfect metaphor for the effect of each core count on both heat production and power investment. The less guys, or the less cores we have, the less it takes to keep it cool, and the less voltage required for an equal clock. In this case, we can kind of view it as... To get the same amount of work done, if we have a bunch of guys standing around, as long as we have less guys, we can pay less money to accomplish the same amount of work. Now, ordinarily, this would be the kind of thing you figure out at the time of buying your chip. Did you want 2 cores, 4, 6, 8, 12, 16, hell, 32 or more? But you can actually adjust how many cores your PC has after buying, at least in the negative direction. And this is what I'm going to use for today's test in order to see how much, if any, Total War benefits from cores, threads, and certain background window stuff that I'll get to at the end. So, unlike last week, we're going to compare every result this time against two previous results. One, we're going to have our original base clock, and two, we're going to have a modified clock that roughly lines up with this one. As a friendly reminder, the base clock on this chip is 3.2 GHz, which I have locked in place with a locked static voltage as well. As a, fresher, as a refresher, it took an average of 82 seconds to load in a new instance of Immortal Empires campaign, with a 1 second deviation, and emitted runs of 80 and 82 seconds for too fast and too slow respectively. For end turn times, it took 41 seconds on average, again with a 1 second deviation and emitted runs of 40 and 43 seconds. And then lastly, in the laboratory benchmark, it put down a 39 frame per second average with a 0.1, second, or 0 .1, <laughs> 0.1 frame per second deviation and emitted runs of 39.2 and 38.7 frames per second. 
All right, so last week I made the 8-core Ryzen look like it had the minimum requirements for speed at just 2.8 gigahertz. But what happens when we bring it down to minimum cores in addition to that 2.8 gigahertz frequency? Pain. Pain is what happens. A new campaign took 118 seconds on average, which, as you may notice, is absolutely terrible. Deviation was also really wide at 6 seconds, and there was an emitted run of 124 and 114 seconds. End turn times didn't fare much better either, with a 51 second time frame in spite of being one of the more simple runs, i.e. there wasn't a lot of variables happening. Variation was 2 seconds, with emissions being 53 and 50 seconds, and there was also a really noticeable lag for basically every event that could happen. Uh, but as weak as all that was, literally nothing compares to the complete and total travesty that was the benchmark. Again, as a friendly reminder, while this was run at maximum everything and there is the no LOD mod odd, this is still only 1080p. So what did 1080p look like? 23.4 frames per second. 23.4 frames per second. That's absolutely brutal. That's below the minimums on a lot of the other runs that I did. Towards the end of it, there were times where the minimum frame rate on this run dropped down to 14 frames per second, which had things literally looking like a slideshow. Deviations were only 0.1 frame per second, which I guess is kind of expected when it's already so slow to begin with, and there was a blistering 23.6 frame per second run emitted, and one of 23.3 frames per second emitted. Alrighty, so that was super depressing, but what about our overclocked results? You may remember that we had the 8-core chip boosted all the way up to 4.1 GHz, which is all it could take on static voltage before the stability of it fell off a cliff. But what if we only had half the cores? Could that change things at all? Well, into the BIOS I went to disable one of my two chiplets, which I'll explain later, and I began seeing if I could push the clocks anywhere higher. I managed to eke it all the way back up to my normal day-to-day -day overclock of 4.25 GHz, before once again I started to run into stability issues past that point. So how did this more aggressive overclock work? Eh, decently I guess in some ways, but also kind of really disappointing in others to me. Immortal Empire's campaign took 58 seconds unanimously, average, fastest, slowest, everything was 58 seconds, which was not too bad, I will say. Uh, end turn times managed to clock in at 44 seconds average, with a 1 second deviation and a 46 and 42 second run emitted for too fast, too slow, and the benchmark was acceptable. It managed 39.1 frames per second on average, with a 39 second emission and a 39.6 second emission, and a deviation of up to 0.2 frames per second. This is better than the base clock, but you'll notice it's also substantially down from what the overclocked results were on all 8 cores. Considering how limited Total Warhammer actually seems to care about multiple threads and cores, I was kind of disappointed to see how poorly this fared in comparison to the 8 core chip, which really should have actually done worse. Alright, so if 8 cores and 16 threads did really good, and then 4 cores and 8 threads did pretty good, and then 2 cores and 4 threads did not so good, you would logically expect 4 cores, 4 threads to be very similar to the performance of the 2 core chip, right? Well, this is where I... Remember how last week I said the results really get weird for this one? This is where they show up. So by turning hyper-threading off, I turned this into a 4-core, four 4-thread four chip, which logically should actually have less available workflow potential compared to the 4-core with hyper-threading on. So Mortal Empires was exactly the same. 58 seconds, bang, 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 everything was 58 seconds. End turn times, though, dropped down to a 42-second average with, again, almost flawless consistency. There was a 1-second deviation, a 40 and a 45-second emission for too fast and too slow, but the benchmark is where things get really, really interesting. This went all the way up to 40.7 frames per second average, which you'll notice is pretty goddamn close to the 8 cores result. In fact, like this is closer to the 8 core than it is to the other 4 cores result. Um, for frame of reference, there was zero deviation there. There was a 40.6 emission for too slow and a 41.1 for too fast. But, I mean, like, this blew my mind. And it's not a fluke either. Like, this was across seven tests, and I even went back and checked it on the 8-core with the hyper-threading turned off, and sure enough, yeah, it did better. Like, I guess hyper-threading really, really seems to restrict the performance of this particular game. So, what are some conclusions we can draw from this? Well, first things first, does Total Warhammer benefit from more cores? The answer to this one's a little bit complicated, like if everything else remains the same, the same clocks and everything else, then yes, it'll benefit from more cores. Even in my results where the 8 core was slightly detuned compared to the 4 core, we still saw a mild performance drop going to the 4 core. 
However, this was kind of a weird setup due to me wanting to keep consistency in the voltages between runs. In reality, you could give the 4-core a pretty substantial overclock over the 8-core, and I suspect the results would be just as good, if not even better, than the 8-core. And considering how much cheaper the 4-core is, if you were buying a CPU, you could, you could instead use those savings on a better cooler and then guarantee yourself better performance than what the 8-core would have provided. However, I'm sure most of you don't exclusively use your PCs as total war machines, and an 8-core can absolutely murder a 4-core in many other applications out there. So like myself, I do a little bit of programming and modeling for fun, and before you ask, I'm hot garbage at it, but an 8-core here like literally doubles the performance over a 4-core. And frankly, when I'm compiling my videos, I saw a colossal jump in performance when I went from my old 4-core up to my current 8-core. There's also one other factor I'll discuss later that works in, for, uh, in favor of the bigger core count chips, but there is a limit to this though. Would I recommend going to a 32 core Threadripper for gaming? No, obviously not. You would just be wasting the overwhelming majority of the chip at any given moment. One other instance though I will say where more cores helped was in aiming for the minimum spec clocks. With 8 cores I had an average frame rate of 34.5 frames per second. Not good performance by any stretch of the imagination, but still heads and shoulders above 23.4 frames per second. So, like, having a dual core versus an 8-core, 8-core very clearly helped out. And, like, I don't need to tell you, but a difference that severe, being almost 50%, is immediately noticeable. Alright, next up. Is minimum spec an okay way to play? Listen, everyone's gonna have a difference of opinion about what counts as acceptable. Some people consider anything less than 60 frames per second unacceptable, while other folks would happily play at 30 frames per second without even noticing. Some people wouldn't dare to accept anything less than 1440p, other people might not even notice pixels down at 720p, like there's a huge range out there. That said, I expect most people would not enjoy Total Warhammer at the minimum specs, like even at just 1080p, which is not a particularly high resolution, the battle turned into a complete slideshow at the end, and I don't care how low of a minimum frame rate you will accept, you will absolutely notice judders when you get all the way down to 14 frames per second. It's like painfully obvious to look at. I would strongly recommend aiming higher than minimum. To be blunt, I would strongly recommend aiming higher than recommended. Would I turn down CPU cores for playing? No. Uh, if you've got an 8, 12, or even a 16 core and it's cooled sufficiently, just leave it alone. Maybe on some of the super old games, and by super old, I mean like turn of the millennium old, you might see a really tiny improvement, but in general, the amount of time you're going to be wasting to do this every time you boot up your PC, it's just going to be annoying to deal with. Just leave it alone for your own own sake. Would I turn off hyper-threading for playing games? <sighs> Here's where I'm going to annoy a lot of people. Yes, yes I would. Here's the thing. Hyper-threading works by dividing up the CPU's cores to focus on two things at once, but the thing is, is it can't do both of those things to perfect efficiency. Before I conducted these tests, I saw a litany of people in forums and online exclaiming about how brilliant hyperthreading is and how there's next to no performance loss anymore. But what the thing that no one almost posted was proof, or even if they did post proof, it was on an extremely limited sample size of games and with no real data to back up how they got those results. Let me be clear here. There are definitely, definitely some games that will benefit noticeably from having more threads available. And if you're on a lower count CPU, like a dual core or a four core, you'll probably see a noticeable uptick, especially on those particular games. But I tried out a few other games too, just to make sure this wasn't Total Warhammer, uh, with all my cores active, and I would say more games lost performance than gained performance with hyper-threading on. And that's completely ignoring a lot of the games just didn't care. This kind of makes sense. Even on modern games, almost no one's developing a game with an 8-core CPU being the minimum requirement. Even Ashes of the Singularity, with the brilliant Nitrous Engine, still calls for a 4-core as minimum spec, so on something like that, you can naturally assume that they're either expecting to see 4 or 8 threads to use. Incidentally, even that crazy super modern game engine still ran better without hyper-threading than with it. Most other games have way lesser requirements than that too, so like at the point where you're using an 8-core, the extra threads are kind of pointless. For Total Warhammer, performance was better with the 4-core and the 8-core systems when hyper-threading was turned off. The one place I did expect to see a large performance loss, my video work, also didn't seem to care at all that I turned off hyper-threading. So, in spite of all the internet comments I read, my personal testing shows a performance loss with it on, while turning it off didn't seem to lead to any noticeable performance loss uh, on modern titles. And I'll simplify that statement even further. Since these results, and since poking around, I have now left hyper-threading disabled on my own system all the time now. Without out of the way, 
feel free to go down to the comments and start bashing me for forgetting about these one or two unrelated games that showed a different result. But in general, no, I would say leave hyper-threading off. You're just going to be wasting performance. Why didn't I do a 6-core? Well, there's two reasons for this. One that's really technical and one that's really simple. We'll start with the simple one. This already took about a week to do all on its own, and a 6-core would have simply split the difference most likely between an 8-core and a 4-core, but that would have still cost me another couple days worth of work for that kind of irrelevant result. But a second and more interesting reason is I suspect it wouldn't have been appreciably better than the 4-core in this particular test, but that's due to how Ryzen is laid out. It has chiplets of 4 cores each, so in my case, the 2700 is actually just two of these chiplets, 4 plus 4 equaling 8 cores. However, testing the chip in 4 core meant that I could keep each chiplet intact, so communications within each core were still using the lightning quick 192 gigabit per second CPU cache, whereas if I had forced them to go to two separate chiplets, I now have to run each chiplet with two cores, uh, with one core each disabled, but I have to use a substantially slower infinity clock. Not only would these results have been super boring, but I suspect anyone looking for more meaning behind them probably would have gotten bad data because it's not representative of all 6-core chips. What were the effects on thermals from all of these? So I should specify, for all the tests that you saw, I didn't have hardware monitor running in the background. In fact, I didn't have anything running in the background because I wanted to minimize variables. But I did pull up a whole seven runs of benchmarks for all of these with hardware running, uh, hardware monitor running in the background just so we could see what the effects of thermals were. With the worst case scenario, this would be the 8 core with the 4.1 gigahertz over overclock. Um, this was a 70 degree run. It's not exactly cold by any stretch of the imagination. It's still a long way away from thermal throttling, but it wouldn't be the kind of temperature I'd want to keep my CPU at, uh, running at forever. I should specify that was without any voltage adjustments. That 70 degrees that you're seeing, that is exclusively down to the overclock. Um, for the best case scenario, we had the 2.8 gigahertz under underclocked uh, dual core. This one hit a grand total of 34 degrees, and in case you're wondering how it even managed to accomplish that, it's because my fans on my radiator don't even run at anything less than 30 degrees. They just stop. Um, so it only managed to basically just turn on the fans to their minimum speed. Um, for the two four-core runs, the uh, hyper-threading run managed 50 degrees, and the non-hyper-threading run managed 52 degrees. I don't think that there's an honest difference between the two of them. I think it's just one happened to reach a couple degrees more than the other. Um, yeah, it wasn't really overly surprising obviously as you ramp more cores in and obviously as you ramp up the speed temperatures go up accordingly in my past few videos why did i keep saying don't ask about windows 7 okay so this might not apply to much of you in fact i'm gonna go on a limb here and say this probably doesn't apply to any of you but it might be interesting knowledge about computers all the same so if you're interested just keep watching but if you want to skip the section consult the timestamp to skip ahead to the next one so for the previous examples i have always kind of skipped over the fact that i'm running ryzen on windows 7 because for the previous ones, there was zero impact for you, the viewer. This time, however, there actually is an impact. So I'm going to get all into all of that right now. First things first, Ryzen isn't natively supported on Windows 7. You can force it to work, but it'll make the installation process super annoying the first time around. Because your BIOS for Ryzen, or any BIOS for any Ryzen chip, isn't expecting you to use Windows 7, it doesn't come with USB drivers for Windows 7. This can be problematic because you actually need the USB drivers to use a keyboard and mouse for the first time setup. And of course you can't get into those drivers without getting into the first time setup. Now getting around this can be done in multiple ways, but the quick and easy solution is just to use an old PS2 mouse and keyboard. And PS2 does not refer to PlayStation 2, but those really old school round connectors. They will work without driver support of any kind. And as an interesting factoid, some people will uh, consider them to be a superior connector to USB, kind of like how some folks prefer vinyl to CD. This will let you boot into Windows, but you still won't have any USB drivers. Now, you can download them online and forcibly insert them into the registry, and voila, you now have Ryzen working on Windows 7. Okay, so now that you've got Ryzen working on Windows, or heck, maybe you're just on a different chipset and still on Windows 7, 8 or 8.1, but your performance might still feel off somehow. Maybe you're seeing a few less frames per second than I am, or maybe you notice that the CPU seems to respond really slowly sometimes, but without any real reason. Well, this is all thanks to a lovely, annoying feature on Windows 7 called Core Parking. Core Parking is essentially the ability for Windows to automatically turn off cores when they aren't needed, with the intention being to save energy. I only bring this up for people on Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, because by default, Core Parking is turned off on Windows 10, though those of you who are on manufactured PCs, or those of you especially who are on laptops on Windows 10, might still have it on by default. So, remember our dudes in the hole? Imagine if we could send the guys who aren't really doing much work home and then simply call them back in whenever we need them. 
Now, this is a brilliant feature in theory, right? But they can't just teleport. There'd be a delay between when you told them to go home and when they get home for them to come back to the work site. And this is also true of core parking. Just because we need another core doesn't mean it instantly comes online. It has to ramp back up before it can do anything. Now, those of you with a quick mind might also notice a second issue. Remember, we can only pay everyone the same wage when we overclock. So our plan to have our heat budget, we have to assume that everyone is there and working because otherwise the system's gonna overheat when those extra cores come back online. This means we have to clock to the worst case scenario, but we don't get magical clock increases when those cores go away. And then finally, Windows in general is really stupid, I've noticed, about when it needs another core or when it doesn't. Frequently, a core will come back online to deal with an extremely temporary momentary spike, like, I don't know, loading something quickly. But the core will come back online too late to have done anything about the spike and will simply make some heat as it ramps back on and then turns back off again. Or in the opposite perspective, sometimes when I'm gaming, a core might temporarily get unloaded and then ramps down and shuts off only to bog the system down really hard when that game asks that core to come back online. Now, this basically always leads to a system that is almost always negative for a gaming PC. In general, it's really bad for any computer that wasn't a laptop, hence why I think they turned it off by default when Windows 10 rolled around. To turn it off in Windows 7, 8, and 8.1 requires the scariest of all things possible. Registry editing. Dun dun dun! Anyways, I'll walk you through exactly how to disable this because seriously, if you're not on a laptop, you don't want it on. Like, ever. Alright, to begin with, click Start, type in Reg Edit, and open it up. In the list on the left hand side, expand H key underscore local machine, then System, then Current Control Set, then Control, then Power, and then finally go to the Power Settings tab. From here, we're going to locate the uh, listed file name, I'll have it up on the video. Then we are going to look for 0cc 5b647 cldf 4637 891 Jesus Christ, what a name. Anyways, we are going to change the value min and the value max each to become 0. This value adjusts how many of your cores are allowed to park. So on my 8 core system, for example, 75% would mean 6 cores could still park, 50% would mean 4 cores could still park, 25% would only allow 2 cars to park and 0% would allow literally every single, uh, would prevent every single core from ever parking. Again, unless you're on a laptop, you do not want any of these on. Once you've got it down to the number you want, you'll have to restart your computer before it'll initialize. Don't expect to see any massive gains in performance or anything. I didn't measure the results from when I did this way back in the day, like this is years old for me, but you can definitely feel less judder after doing it, especially when hitting the end turn button, but also it'll help out in general with your system's performance. Lastly, any free performance tips? Well, I mean, yeah, we already hit them all in the last two episodes combined. First things first, turn off hyperthreading. If you're on anything other than Windows 10, disable core parking. Then overclock the CPU within an inch of its life and check for stability. Or if your CPU cooler tends to be a little bit weaker, turn on the boost clock and let that manage it for you. When it does come to overclocking, read guides to give you a good base to work from and you can tweak it from there. Lastly, make sure not just your CPU has a good cooler, but that you've got good airflow coming through the entire case so that that cooler can get rid of the heat. Remember, all the cooler's doing is pumping heat from your CPU into the air within your case. So if the air is not getting pumped out of your case, you're going to go right back to square one and overheat the CPU. On a similar note, if it's a warm day or if you're in a small room, make sure that the room itself also has a good method of getting rid of the heat. Otherwise, again, all we're going to do is move the heat from the case into the room and then have nowhere else to dump the heat. Anyways, that's it for the CPU stuff. Next week, we're going to move on to GPUs, checking old versus new, as well as overclocking, as well as what the various game settings and content do to performance. As always, I want to thank you so much for hanging out, and I'll see you all next time.